have a new part of FEMA that we're putting together um, just talking about what we're going to be doing and how we'll be interacting with um, sort of the community at large, I guess. So for me, it's a new focus. Uh, so, so here's our goals to evolve new technologies for use in biodiesel and other energy, alternative energy applications. So um, in creating this new thing, it's really an old thing, right? We've been doing sort of research and development for a long time, but we haven't had it as a specific sort of arm of what we do. Um, I want it to be specific in the sense that our knowledge base is in biodiesel, but not so specific that as biodiesel comes and goes and technology changes, we sort of come become out of date. So I, I do want to get into all other alternative energy as well. Um, help bring ideas from the lab to the market. This so far is what we've been best at doing. Um, commercialization of existing technologies. Uh, we're not uh, we're not uh, you know research triangle part, uh, but we can take stuff that exists and apply it um, in situations that other people may not have considered applying things to. Um, and then this is sort of closest to my own heart and what I want to do um, with my time in doing this job is expand open access to information whenever possible. Um, so not everything that we're going to do is going to be sort of open access. There's going to be some patent stuff that we work with on things. But as much as I can, I want to um, interact with this giant community of folks out there who are just interested in learning and creating. I mean, it's sort of the development of Piedmont Biofuels has, has come through those people. It is those people. And working with those people is key. And I, just, I think it's something that's underutilized um, with the connection between those people and industry. And hopefully we can help develop that connection. So what do we bring to the table? A lot of production expertise. Um, I've made small batches to large batches, 4,000 gallons a day. Um, lab skills, ASTM testing, obviously we do that. We have a, an industrial facility. Um, that's capable of doing ASTM testing, and I personally also have a lot of lab skills. Plan design and implementation, we have a um, we have a design build wing that builds plants anywhere from trailer size to a million gallons a year. Uh, so things that we do, things that we design, things that we research, we can put into production immediately, um, which is nice. And it also cuts down on communication. We're having to work with a bunch of different people. Um, David, who's the head of design build, you know, will have seen the progress on something that I've been working on and already know about it in order to be able to implement it quickly. And also experience, and not me personally necessarily, but the project as a whole has a lot of experience with a lot of people and a lot of different knowledge. And with those things, hopefully, the idea is to create commercialized new technologies. Um, so our lab, we've got a lot of different things. We've got a GC. I mean, it's a pretty, you know, for a good size body, so Plant. It's a pretty good lab. So water inside of flashpoint acid. So cold soak is a new one um, that's pretty important. Actually, we failed it a couple times. So that's something you have to pay attention to. Glycerin quality. We're doing methanol recovery and glycerin refining now. So we have some tests for that and more on the way. And uh, like I said, we test for ASTM and European standards. Um, and really, really cool. In our town, we have this great little college called Central Carolina Community College. Actually, Piedmont Biofuels um, was sort of formed in that space. So the first class that was offered in 2002, the teachers were um, Leith and Rachel, who were the founders of Piedmont Biofuels. And since they left the college, the college continued to develop the program through Andy, who was here the first day. Um, he got a bunch of money to get a bunch of lab equipment and create an associate's degree in biofuels. Um, it's one of the few in the country but I think it's going to be one of the best. It's really specific to small scale biodiesel. Really neat stuff. Also, the lab guy there is Bob Armentrout. Um, and Bob's been really good with taking essentially industrial resources and applying them for home reuse, GC especially. Um, doing a lot of sort of cross checking with homebrew folks to tell them the quality of their fuel in advance, fuel quality testing on a small scale. Um, so he's actually in that lab, and they're interested in doing small-scale testing. Um, so having folks send in samples and do testing. Um, so that's something just to sort of keep your ear to the ground as, as this moves along and they get this underway um, to see if you can't send some samples that you might want tested to them. It's pretty neat. So given the interesting stuff, here's our new stuff. What have we been doing for the past year and a half? 
One of the things that we've been working on is our gravitational reactor. So this we started working on last summer. Uh, David and I worked on it for about five or six months. Um, we went through a variety of iterations, and eventually, uh, even the even the initial iterations showed promise, where they did get good conversion. Um, but we finally did get to something that worked. So. Um, Basically, it's a continuous flow reactor that can handle variable feedstocks. So we've tested stuff up to 1% moisture, that's 10,000 parts per million, pretty high, and free fatty acid percent of 8. Now, 8% free fatty acid translates into about a homebrew titration of 15, uh, just, just to give that as a comparison. Uh, it's continuous production, so that model right there runs at 4, I can't remember, 4 or 5 gallons a minute. The model that we have at the co-op runs at four gallons a minute. That's oil side. So the oil is coming in at four gallons a minute, and there's five-ish gallons of biodiesel glycerin coming out the back. Um, it's continuous. So you can imagine if you ran this 16 hours a day, it's about a two to three million gallon a year plant. Um, obviously, it doesn't include water washing or anything else, but on the on the uh, on the transportation side, it's a pretty big plant. So. No extra methanol, no extra catalyst to speak of, same as what you do in an apple seed batch. Um, it's really probably properly sized for plants that are larger than 75-ish thousand per year. And that's a general number. You really just, you have to look at your situation and see what it costs and decide whether or not it's worth it. Um, but for the amount that it can do and for the ease of use, uh, it's, it's, it's really nice. Um, so also, can I, I'm going to get to the, just write your questions down, I'm going to get to the end of talking about the cavitator, and then I'll take a whole bunch of questions in the just to sort of finish the thought. The thing, the, the reason that I was so excited about it when we first started looking into it, in fact, we first started looking into this because we were looking into continuous reactors. Um, David and I were pretty much unique at Piedmont. Um, everyone else thought we were wasting gigantic amounts of our time, but uh, it ended up working out, which is nice. Uh, but the other thing that we were working on was the microwave reactor. This ended up winning out and doing better than the microwave reactor. But the reason I was focused on them both would be because on a small scale, and I don't mean apple seed size, but small scale plants, small scale collectors, bodies and producers, um, this will help you minimize your labor input. And that's what we've been talking about this whole conference is uh, who's going to do the work, right? In a cooperative, is it the members? Right? Are you going to try to finagle them out to do the work? Uh, are you going to hire somebody to do the work? Are you going to create an LLC and do the work yourself and get reimbursed? Right? Who's going to do the work on a small scale? That work piece is a really expensive part. Um, so minimizing that can save you a lot. And because this is a four or five gallon a minute um, processor, instead of doing a 250 gallon batch, you get a 10,000 gallon tank on the input side, a 10,000 gallon tank on the output side, and stick the cavitator in the middle, and all of a sudden, you can do a 10,000 gallon batch, continuous batch, right? You drain the whole tank. Um, so you, you, you get big tanks on the input and output side, and it saves you a reactor, essentially. So it's a pretty good deal. Um, it allows smaller producers to be able to minimize the amount of time they actually spend in the reactor. Um, how many hours do you have on it? We have a lot. So we've got four plants. We've got the co-op. Um, we have the testing that we did on the original models. We have Bull City Biodiesel or Carolina Biofuels, which has actually purchased one of these. And then we have another one installed in Virginia. We have a whole bunch of gallons on them. We put WDO through them, virgin oil through them, and chicken fat through them. And they all work fine. Uh, doesn't need any heat, not a big advantage. Um, temperatures as low as 59 degrees Fahrenheit. That was actually one of the first batches that we got to pass was at 59. And then also as high as 120, it doesn't really matter. Um, then how does it work? Um, it's, it's essentially, it, it's pretty straightforward. It's a high shear gear pump, though you can use any type of gear pump, we've used other gear pumps as well, uh, with an internal bypass. So that internal bypass will kick on at a certain output pressure, and uh, the output of the pump will then, instead of going on, it will go through that bypass, come back around to the beginning of the pump, and get, get sent to the pump again. Uh, so if that pump is doing mixing in of itself and there's reaction going on in the pump, the more you research through it, obviously the more reaction you're going to get. So having an internal bypass helps a lot of the reactions occurring there. And then also there's a cavitational valve, which is a, it's essentially passing from a high pressure to a low pressure zone. And as it passes 
from the high pressure to a low pressure zone, you get cavitation. Um, that pretty much finishes out the reaction by the time it comes out. It comes out looking pretty much like peanut butter. If you let it sit for five minutes, you'll see the glycerin settle out. Take the top sample and test it. Um, it tests amazingly well. We, were, we actually really didn't believe our results when we first did it, because we get glycerin tests of, you know, 0 0.02 and Rachel's like, you, <laughs> you screwed something up, basically. And so we redo it and we get 0 0.05. Like, it, it took a while to sort of believe it. Hey, take it easy, Alex, man. It's good seeing you. We'll probably run into you tomorrow. Yeah, cavitation is cool, a trial. It's a late uh, but uh, cavitation, the best example of cavitation is in a pump. So, um, I guess when you're going into a pump, especially in the case if you have the input side limited, right, you're pulling a vacuum on that input side. So, so, so here's the input side of a pump, and here's the output side of a pump, and here's our little valve. Okay, so on the input side of the pump, Let's ignore the valve, but just to explain cavitation, you had a valve here, let's say, and you had somewhat closed it off. That's when you get your pump cavitating, right? That's when you typically hear cavitation. You hear it in a pump. It's a bad thing because it'll, um, it'll wear down the internals of the pump. So what's happening is you have a low pressure zone here. Basically, you're pulling somewhat of a vacuum on the liquid here because it's not, because a gear pump has to push through a fixed quantity of liquid. It's really trying to suck it through here, and because you have this valve somewhat closed off, um, it's it's just there's, there's a lot of there's just pulling a vacuum on the side of the pump, um, and as it does that, certain anything any liquid in here that has a vapor pressure, um, which as you pull that vacuum goes from liquid phase to gas phase, that's what's going on, right? You're changing that point at which a liquid will go from. Um, from liquid phase to gas phase. Methanol, for example, right? So you're getting stuff going into gas phase here. And gas phase, something that's liquid takes up this much space, and something that's gas takes up this much space. So all of a sudden, you have this huge pressure for this gas going out. And as it goes to the pump, that pressure gets released. You go back into a state where you've got a high pressure, right? And those bubbles essentially recondense into liquid. And as they recondense, you get localized really, really high pressures and temperatures. That's my best explanation and understanding. So you get these localized explosions, I guess is what you could say. And that's causing really, really, really good mixing. And that's why you don't need the heat, right? You need heat, time, and mixing. And in our case, there's not a lot of time, there's not a lot of heat, but the mixing is tremendous because of those localized explosions. If you want to know more about cavitation, so you can just wiki it. I mean, there's information around on it. In general, the reaction, I mean, you're just increasing the surface area between your reactants, right? Just yeah, it's the like same old thing. It's just better mixing. It's just really, really insane mixing. It's insane mixing. That's exactly what it is. Do you think it's better than ultra-high shear? Like three-stage ultra-high shear? I don't know. Can they do what we can do? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not being a smart ass, but like, that's yes. my question. I don't know. Well, then I guess it's as good. Um, but what's your energy for that? It's just a pump. I mean, how big a pump, though? It's, it's a... Uh, what is it? It's a, it's like it's a, a, a one and a half horsepower one pump. One and a half horsepower. Yeah. yeah there's a around, 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 five five gallons per minute. Yeah. Five gallons per minute. One and a half for five GB. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's... At what pressure? The output pressure is like 250-ish. Okay. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a pump. And you can do it with other gear pumps, by the way. It does work. It's just you're going to change your flow. Um, so, uh, there, there, and by the way, there are other cavitational reactors out there that exist. Um, um, the point is, ours is a lot cheaper and easier, essentially. Uh, and you're making this yourself? Yeah. Yep. Are we using as the, the cavitation device? Uh, well, I mean, the pump these? is the cavitator. Uh, yeah, we do. We sell these. So, we sell these on all the new plants that we build. And I asked David before I came, I was like, well, how much do you want me to say, not say? I sort of, he sort of, I let him reserve the right to say as much as he wanted. Um, but if you have a lot of questions about it, you can just call David and ask. And I'll tell you as much as he wants to tell you. Um, but it's, it's pretty straightforward and simple, and I bet if you mess with it, you can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but, by the way, um, so like I said, in starting this, there's certain, I'm sort of walking this path between wanting to open source as much as possible, but respecting other people's right to um, not. Um, so I, I sort of play that game. 
but but we, we had to put a lot of work into the, putting the pieces in the right place and hitting the system so that it was um, so that it would flow without you having to mess with it all the time. That's where the work went into it in terms of our design piece mostly. So um, so I pretty much got that. And, and actually, the, the most time we spent on this whole thing was getting the stupid inputs metered correctly. Uh, because the way that they come in is they come in in three streams, right? Well, it depends on how you want to do it. Let's say they come in two streams. So here's the methoxide. Um, and here's your oil. Well, you got to have a meter here. you got to have a meter here. And like I was saying in, this, in the other thing, it's really hard to... Um, really hard to determine the flow of oil for some reason. They don't make a lot of flow meters that work with vegetable oil. They really don't. Who makes the best one? Who makes the best one? You can use a sort of standard, um, oh, what do they call them? It's uh, just like flow cat. I mean, those basic ones that are spring yeah. um, meters, they will work, but they're not going to be quite correct. What's the best? <laughs> What's the best? What are you using? That, you those ones. ones. It's, not, it's not flow cat. It's yeah, the what, other one. What percentage? A variance error? Uh, several percent. A couple percent. Yeah. And so that's why, you, have, you know, and, and this is on the sort of, this is on the co op model that's like as cheap as possible. Um, so we're, you know, there are, there, there, are much more, there are much more expensive flow meters that you can use to get much more exact numbers. But they're just, they're just really expensive. Um, and you can do it cheaper, but you kind of got to pay attention to it a little bit more. And that's all. And the automation stuff, by the way, by the way would, be, would be great for this. Are we in the question section? Not yet, actually. Let's, let's, let's <laughs> stick to that rule. Um, the other thing that you can do here, by the way, is instead of using um, methoxide, because this, this is kind of pointless to me, what we're trying to do is minimize labor input. So let's put methanol over here, and let's put um, methylate over here. Right? Now we don't have to do anything. Now what we've got is our tanks that are sitting outside full of the stuff that we get in tanker loads anyway. Um, we don't have to pre-mix anything or think about proportion. All the proportioning occurs through the valves and through our flow meters. Um, and that saves you a lot of time. So this is sort of our end goal. Um, we've done this, but again, methylate is insanely basic. And so getting um, proper equipment to be able to um, determine flow with methylate is, is hard to do. Um, so we're still working on that, but um, all this stuff works. One more. There's Tim. <laughs> I like this one. Uh, it, it sort of shows that, like, though this is really neat, cool stuff, this has fancy high tech, like, this is where we do it. So, um, <laughs> this is Tim, and here, here's the pump. Uh, here's the little cavitational valve. And if you were to come on a tour, we would show you all the same stuff. Um, so, we're not, you know, we're not trying to keep this up that secret. Um, and then here's our inputs. You can't quite see, but there's an input coming in here, and then there's an input coming through this line. And in our case, we do actually pre-mix our methoxide. We don't do methanol and methylate separately. Um, but on the bigger models that we've done for the, like the folks in Virginia, um, they're separate. So, uh, any questions on the, on the cavitational stuff that I can answer? It looked like on the previous picture, the, the cavitation valve was supposed to be on the inside part of the pump. Can you point out where the... Yeah, it's right here. That's the output side. This is the output side of the pump, sorry. Oh, I thought the cavitation valve was on the inside. No, from the output. And here, this little zone right here is where you have your high pressure zone. So your pump, and here's your little, uh, your little internal bypass. So you got your internal bypass going. Um, you got about 220, 250 PSI in this area because you've closed this valve off significantly to limit output flow. And then it's through that valve that you get cavitation to sort of finish off the ring. And like I said, what comes out, I guess, you can't even tell. Um, what is it? Uh, yes, right here. That's a back pass. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That goes back. We research the tank a little bit before we start. But so what comes out there is the stuff that looks like peanut butter, but it's actually biased. What kind of temperature difference? You said it's high pressure, which raises the temperature. I guess it takes off one from one to the other. Yeah, I mean, because it's going through the, it, there's some friction and shearing. There is a temperature difference, but it's not really noticeable. It's not like it comes out and you're like, ooh, it's warm or it's hot. It's just, it's not pretty much what we're Well, respecting your open source and this is proprietary in nature, is this going to be available? Yeah, sure. Great. Um, 
And do you guys know what the vacuum pressure you drop? The vacuum put on the vacuum? No. Side? No. Okay. no. That's a great question, though. You know, we should throw a T on there and try it out. That would be yeah. That, that, that would be a good question. Um, really, the cavitation is. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> so, uh, really, the cavitation isn't going on in the pump. You don't want to oh, ruin your pump. You know, yeah. it does happen when you're adjusting your valves because you are limiting your input. And so you do create a little cavitation initially, but once you get it set and running, it just runs. Um, but the cavitation is occurring here. So, not. Okay. Sure. What do you use? Have you thought about using um, um, peristaltic pumps to feed the input side? Yes, in fact, we, we did that. So that, that was one of the things that we did. Um, it was a flow meter issue, essentially. And we have a, not a salt pump, but just a regular old, like, pure water pump that just feeds it to keep it from being pulled. Well, I, I, I mean to, to actually meter exactly what you want going in. Would that yeah. work? Yeah, that might work. Okay. Um, I'm worried a little about the peristaltic pumps. You know why? Because it's not, it's not continuous. Um, it's, 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 I'm worried because it pulses. That's right. And, and because it pulses, I'm not absolutely sure that we're getting good mixing coming into the window. That's well, that's what well, I'm well I got like methylene in a, a tube. In like a little that. tube, yeah. yeah. You know, they do make super chemical resistant yeah. pumps because they are used primarily in, in chemical plants. Any other questions? Well, how is it sitting on the other side? Uh, how long do you allow the, the mixed peanut butter stuff to settle? It settles out within about it. 10 minutes. Uh, you, you, I can't say that. Yeah. Most visual settling occurs after 10 minutes. Okay. One of the issues that we have seen because the cavitation is used frequently to mix two things that don't traditionally mix together. That's why people do it. They're trying to mix like diesel fuel and water. You know, they're trying to keep in solution. This will, we, and we, and we still have work to do on this, by the way. Um, it's still, there's still advancements to make. Um, but one thing that we may have found is that it's a little bit harder to get free glycerin out with this than a traditional reaction. And I'm not absolutely sure about that. It may have been contaminated in the lines, but we had a couple cases where it was like funny, we were sort of failing free glycerin by, by a little bit. And we shouldn't have because we water washed. And normally a water wash would take it all out. Um, so there's, you know, there's a couple small things, but we're able to pass ASTM very well with this. Yeah. Did you ever try ultrasonic at all? Did you ever try those? That's your whole reactor. Yeah. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I'll take one. Uh, the the valve, like custom yeah. piece or something, you guys just get from Harbor Freight or something? No, it's not from Harbor Freight, it's semi carbon Okay, well, we I just make it. My question is, what kind of materials do you use? Because is a disaster inside of these materials. Yeah, well, one, one, thing, one thing is the pump. We're looking to get a pump that we'll be able to deal better with. Because um, sure. it does cavitate a little at the beginning, like I said, yeah. and, and it's it's stressful on the pump, <clears throat> but there are other pumps that can deal with that better, check on mine and stuff like that. The valve itself, um, honestly, that's that's why we're putting miles on it to see what happens. But so far, we haven't seen anything happen. Like that. It'd be interesting to open it up now and look at that internal and see if you can see yeah, the pitting. Yeah, because I mean, they, 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 they some material damage for cavitation, but most things just get wrecked really fast. They do. It's true. So, what about your class one dip uh, requirements? For, oh, you mean for, um, for the oh yeah, it's well, this is the co-op. Okay. It had explosion proof until you swapped right. it out. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, this is one of the sort of earlier iterations that that but but that one that worked. Um, and so we did we swapped out the um, totally enclosed fan cooled motor for a what what is no, this? It was it was explosion. It wasn't explosion, it was explosion proof, proof when you first gave it to me. That's now right. it's TEFC. Now it's just totally enclosed fan cooled. So, um, but you know we. And this is kind of janky with just like regular old light switch up there, but um, the ones that we make and produce for for actual biodiesel processors is, is all properly spectrum. Like I said, I'll take one. Okay. <laughs> what was the, what did, you didn't say a price, but you're looking at selling them back. I believe David sells them at something like 15000 But like I said, no, 15 And by the way, compare that to other cavitation reactors. 50 or 15 15 one five zero zero zero. Call you can. I'll afterwards. I'll put and David's number on there, and you can call and email him and ask as many questions as you want. Um, so. you, said, you said that at the beginning, this was best skills for seventy five thousand gallon operations, ever? Yeah, per year and up. And like I said, that's a guess. You, you have to. I, I told you the price and integrate it in. Make a model. See how it works for you, and see if it makes sense. Um, sure. But it's not made for home growers, right? It's not going to replace your apple seed. I guess. That's what that, that's I guess what my question was too. I mean, does it sound like this is the kind of thing that could be scaled down? I mean, I don't know how you could get a pump in this. I mean, for the 
Oh, yeah, you can. Oh, you can get rid of yeah. small books. No, you can do it. The only issue is, like I said, the issue is metering, right? Oh, it's, like, it's, ex it's expensive to meter. And then the smaller you get by, expense, by, by the way, the more the expensive the meter is. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you see how it does make more sense. It does make sense, however, put this up to your apple seed and just restart your apple seed, and you'll find that, and I think people are already doing this, sort of, but you'll find that your reaction time will be, you know, 30 minutes instead of two hours. Okay, the, you mentioned here that you yeah, that you ran it with uh, high amounts of water in it. Mm -hmm. First of all, and then next of all, your temperature, you know, 60 degrees to 120 degrees. And 120 degrees, you, you can't go higher than 120. No, you can't. I was just giving a general range that we'd actually tested okay. that. Okay, but the but you were able at 60 degrees to be able to get a good. So you're not that no heat. No, you don't need any heat. It needs to be liquid. So when we did fail, we do chicken fat. So we got a lot of it. So um, chicken fat, you know, gets to 70 degrees and it might start getting solid. <laughs> and we found as things do start to get solid, this doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but as long as it's liquid, even if it's cold, it's still fine. <clears throat> is there is there an actual heating that takes place in the cavitation? No. Or there's no heating. <clears throat> There's no heating element in there or anything like that. It's just well, really good mixing. It's like he said, <coughs> it's just really good mixing. Like using yeah, a deductor times a million. Oh, no, like he said, uh, no, it doesn't really. You, you don't, it doesn't come out and you feel it in your hand and you're like, wow, this is really warm. It's, it, it's, it's not significant. Way to increase the no. um, I'll, and I'll like to hear y'all's uh, free um, uh, separation so of soil water and toads on the road and all that stuff. That's a really cheap I don't, but I don't. What, what, what's your, what's your uh, well, I mean, we'll do that later, but is it, well, I'm going to keep moving on, so just one last, one or two last questions, and then, uh, yeah. yeah. You mentioned uh, adding something like this to an apple seed, you did it, you know, great mixing, I mean, if you did that, uh, would you even need a heating element in your, in your process at all? I mean, you might not. You can mix the chemicals and then run it through that. That's right. You do all the mixing on the hand and wouldn't need heat. No, you might not, and, and, and I would suggest it's really just as simple as, um, and you know that, that, that pressure that I find there, 220, 250 um, uh, PSI in the after that pump, that pressure is necessary mostly because of the speed that we're running this at. That is not the pressure necessary to have this thing work correctly. If you have a smaller pump, you'll actually have a smaller output pressure, but you'll still make the same stuff. So um, what, kind of, what kind of pressures do you need to get the cavitation valve work? I don't know what the low limit is. I don't know. But we have it like 150, you know, like 120. It doesn't have to be that high. It's, it's going to be a slower flow. If you just take a slower flow and restrict it down to a high pressure, you can make this work. Do it all day long. Do it. You can do this with a hand pump if you have a old <laughs> 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 that worked for your place. Yeah, right. Yes, no, no, I think you're probably right. So I, I think it would be awesome if people try it out and have to see that you can cut your reaction. So, so the cavitation valve is basically a small orifice into a cavity. Yeah. Yes. Can you add that out? You can ask this for Casey if you're going to say it. Oh, man, we're, we're still working on it. So you can do, um, you can do caustic stripping using glycerin. So we did a, a few tests. Um, I did, we did 30%, 33% glycerin mixed with 66% vegetable wall, so a third glycerin, through the cavitator single pass, and we reduced FFAs by 50%. Wow. Doing that same mixture um, in, a, in a jar and shaking it with heat, reduced the FFAs by something like 35%. Um, so we, we did get um, better sort of caustic stripping with glycerin, that's what we call it. That's what it's called. Um, with this unit, then you would get typically. We tried acid certification. Um, it didn't work at room temperature, but we're going to continue to test it. Yes, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, in talking to Matt earlier, he mentioned that you're doing the three phase reaction. Is this on a different reactor or this one? Different. Different reactor than this that's one. A, that's okay. our batch reactor. We do that on Tuesday night. Okay, I was just wondering because I'm like, are you just not mentioning that? No, no, no. no we do batch reaction and continuous flow okay. depending on the data we need. Okay. okay, let's keep going then and you can ask uh, Daniel more questions about that. So here's another um, piece. This is kind of what sort of started this as an arm of um, Piedmont. We were working with Max and Associates, they're a company out of State College, Pennsylvania, um, on a homogeneous catalyst. So they are using, they tested a variety of heterogeneous catalysts that other folks have not tested. Um, previous catalysts have mostly been um, earth 
metal oxides, and they're testing other metal oxides. The one that I'll be testing mostly is manganese oxide. Um, they are applied for a patent for this, and, and they're pretty public information. Um, so it's pretty neat. Uh, I know it kind of looks pie in the sky, especially with those numbers. Um, but the fact is, they're, when they came into this about four years ago, they wanted to get into biodiesel. And they were in the academic setting, so they, they work over at um, Penn State. And in the academic setting, in biodiesel, there's two things, right? There's energy as catalyst, and there's supercritical, right? So those are the two things that they saw. Um, so they kind of threw them together, um, came up with some new um, metal oxide catalysts, and found sort of this intermediate. Is this so, super critical? No, it's near super critical. Uh, the, the fact is, I don't really think, when people talk about super critical, they talk about you have a um, level of miscibility between two liquids that kind of goes like this, right? It gets hotter and hotter, it's more and more miscible. You hit super critical, one of the, or both of the liquids, and you go from a miscibility level of this to this. Right. You get this sudden jump. And that's why everyone wants to hit supercritical because it's this sudden jump. Well, their research um, and sort of their opinion and thoughts is they don't really think it's like that. It's not like you just sort of hit this jump. Um, so they found that this works. So they're running reactions. This is 260, actually. 260 C and 1,000 PSI. It's pretty straightforward. So you, we're working on it. It's an HPLC pump, a very small lab scale. Um, it's going through a small little column, very similar, like a pure light column, um, that's packed with this metal oxide catalyst. Um, passes through there, comes out, gets condensed essentially, and then comes out the end of the back pressure, pressure regulator. This is what causes this whole spot beyond the pump to stay at 1,000 psi, right? You just adjust that valve and adjust the pressure in, in here. Um, and coming in here, you have um, your alcohol. They were using ethanol because they're academics. And, some reason. Uh, and uh, <laughs> now, so, so, there's, so there's two things to point out quickly with this. 260 degrees Celsius and 1,000 PSI, and it's a 40 to 1 molar ratio. So we're talking like one and a half times um, the amount of alcohol compared to your old whip. But let's go through why I'm excited and care about this. First off, 1,000 PSI is a lot, but it's reasonable, right? We're not talking 500 atmospheres. We're not talking like 10,000 PSI. This is something that pumps can do. Um, it's, it's a lot, but pumps can do it. 200 degrees Celsius, it's somewhat of a pain because it's above the temperature of water, so now you need a steam system or you use electricity, but it's not outrageous. So Wait. these numbers are high, but they're not outrageous. There's one third option, too. You can use a, um, a liquid transfer fluid and spray it into it. Right, you can also use oil. But there's dangers with that too. So it's true. It's pot. The point is, this, these are these are things that could happen. Um, and then the other thing is the high alcohol amount. Like that's no good. Well, that's true. But you're coming out of this thing a at a really high pressure, right? And at 280 or 260 degrees Celsius. So you're talking about flash evaporation. <laughs> I mean, you're already there. You know, you do a two-stage flash. And you've gotten rid of it. And the reason this is so interesting is you don't produce any soaps. Um, you don't produce any soaps, right? Um, and because you don't produce any soaps and you have no free catalyst, when you want to do your flash, you don't need to separate the streams first. And you don't need to add acid, right? If you were to do a flash evaporation on two streams coming out of a traditional batch reactor, you're going to get reverse reaction because you're taking the methanol out, glycerin and catalysts are still there, you can get reverse reaction. In this case, you're not. So you can do immediate um, separation of, or distillation of your alcohol, which is great because now guess what? Your biodiesel and your glycerin aren't going to want to stay in solution. You have no catalyst and you have no alcohol in it. And so you can do a flow through solution to settling. Because they're going to they're, they're going to separate like that. And they're still probably going to do Celsius. Okay. So, so you, no need for centrifuge right No need for centrifuge. That's my guess. I, 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 I can't imagine you need one, but there's no alcohol and there's no soap. Right. Um, and the flash part in recovering your alcohol is much better. Um, and this, this can convert triglycerides and some fatty acids into bodies. So, oh, so you've got 100% so yield instead of losing. The column, the column, the, the not pack bed has both acid and base solid heterogeneous. Yeah, it will do both. It does. Yeah. In fact, it does free fatty acids. 
more officially Fair. than it does from the service. The way I can tell them then, uh, in that indicates that you're probably not consuming any of your catalysts here, it's just sitting right in the tube and you just keep running it for tens of thousands of hours. Yep, let's go to that. Let me get, let me get to this real fast. Um, here's a couple of the ones that they did test so titanium oxide, potassium aluminum oxide. Um, this is manganese oxide. This is the one we're going to be working with most, I think. Um, and these are the conversions that they found. So, like I said, 40 to 1 alcohol to oil ratio with those temperatures and pressures that I mentioned before. And here's your conversion. Now, don't get this confused. I've got this confused too. You see that conversion number, you say, well, 98% conversion, that's 2% triglycerides or monos or dyes. That wildly fails spec, right? Spec is 0.24. Well, no, because spec is glycerin. Mm -hmm. And triglycerides are mostly not glycerin. Uh, so this is actually pretty darn close to passing. Um, so they're, they're already sort of proven that they're, that they're a rate on the verge, if not already passing. Um, so we've tested with a variety of different metal oxides. Has some costs for water. In fact, small amounts of water improve the reaction. Um, he was using ethanol, and he found that 95% ethanol, 5% water actually had the best reaction rate. Um, Where is the water? Everclear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's expensive. Water down, Everclear. Yeah, water down there. <laughs> Where does the water go? <laughs> It'll stay in the mix. So that will be something actually that will get distilled off of the alcohol. So, and then by the way, that's the case. I'm sure that a bunch of you here do ask in the certification. I mean, you're creating water with that too. You can't not create water if you're doing a certification. Uh, like I said, it greatly simplifies methanol recovery um, and separation. And as you mentioned before, the durability of the catalyst put 500 hours on a single column. Um, and, and saw no loss of activity. So it's quite a durable catalyst, and it tends not to dissolve in the mix as it goes through, which is great. At what rate? At what? What was the? I, I think we figured this out to be. Um, it's a column, quarter inch tube about this long. <laughs> <laughs> so it was probably about what did we figure? Probably four or five liters that went through it. So I mean. That's a, the ratio is pretty kind of Scale that up. Scale it up. Yeah. Hey, uh, have you guys actually done methanol recovery with the tests that have been done so far? With this? With the, with the products of this? this no, 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 no. He hasn't. No. He, you know how he does it? But he doesn't do recovery. And it's not methanol. But he, he gets rid of his alcohol, his ethanol, by just leaving it out. And it just all oh. I mean, it's in the tube. So we're still here. <laughs> so it's exciting stuff. And he closes the doors and he reads it. Yeah. He likes it. It's sweet. You guys are playing the test for production. Are you guys playing the test for acrylate production? No. You would, you would expect acrylate to come out of the glycerin. Yeah. While you flash off, the, after you flash the alcohol, you expect it to Yeah, it reduces temperature. I haven't thought about that. I'd like, uh, yeah. It probably depend on how what you're doing. The thing is, it's not oxidizing, it's not burning, but you still get acrylate production? Yeah, um, I think that it's super critical. Like, I've looked at, I've done some literature review on super critical stuff. And we don't ever talk about it, but they, uh, it's definitely possible. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we'll be coming out with like this. It turns on oxygen availability in the system, but you know, it's going to be dissolved oxygen. Well, that, that's an important thing for us, too. Um, another question is do you know what the McGowan catalyst is? What's that? The McGowan catalyst? Do you see the path here? Yeah. Uh, I'll just pass it in here. I'll take a look. What's that? I'll, I'll look into it. What is it called again? McGowan? McGowan? MCG. It's a free guy's name. It was an undergrad that came up with it. And, and they got it. Is that the guy in like Michigan or something? Yeah. yeah. Is he on oh, TV or something? That one is super pretty. That's right. They're doing it. That one's a, a really high girl. Interesting. I'll have to, I'll just grab it. Yeah, and, and like I said, I'm just getting into this, so I'm excited about learning more. Um, do you have any, any knowledge as to why pure aluminum oxide doesn't work, but calcium aluminum oxide does? No, I don't. Pass link. Not off the top of my head. I mean, is there not an active side on aluminum oxide? Uh, yeah, like no, the, uh, the aluminum just sets up basically like a matrix. Right. And then the calcium is what actually provides the base action. Gotcha. Right. 
he, he's, he's on the team. Okay. He's actually done the stuff before. Uh, so other new stuff, or this is semi new stuff, other stuff that we've done is um, using high voltage. Has anyone tried this, by the way? This is a Grand Lamy special. Yeah, I've seen it. Have, have, has anybody actually tried it in the room? Bad uh, idea. No, it's, not. it's a great idea. Bad idea. It's a great idea. So get a, get a, get a transformer from a neon sign. What? <laughs> okay, anyway, um, I tried it. Uh, and it works. It's really neat. It's really neat, and it, and it really does work. Just like the little video, we stick some things in there, um, and uh, it, it worked. And so I just I ran with it and um, made a little continuous flow separation unit. Um, yeah, spark plugs, little. Um, you, you're talking high voltage flow. <coughs> Yes, that's right. Okay. I, it shocked me. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I can take my stun gun. Just don't do this. <laughs> that's what gets it. Just keep one hand on your head. No, it, it, I, I was well aware of the safety issues. Um, and in fact, that's kind of what stopped the project. Um, so I don't think it necessarily had to, but it, it did what sort of technically pulled me off it. But this is a, essentially a continuous flow unit where it passes between these electrodes at about a gallon a minute. Uh, this is a two inch pipe. And then it went into a subtle chamber, and this subtle chamber is not big. Really By the time it got to the bottom, the glycerin had fallen out. The body is all pretty much stayed at the top. And uh, you just regulate this valve to determine how much glycerin you're pulling off the bottom. And the body is all at about 0.5% glycerin by volume in it in the end. So it was a neat little system that did a gallon a minute, which probably, if someone had a little bit of money, could put some money into it and, and make, a, make something useful out of it. Still involves an alcohol. Oh yeah, this is out of any, like if you were to take this out of your batch reactor, you would just float through this. But it's really probably best suited for a continuous system. But, but you didn't do the other side of it then, because the, the other side is, is that also, this is supposed to be a gradient to collecting the soaps, also. Well, he, he, he did two separate experiments. Yeah, this is not the yeah he, he did one experiment where he did a positive and negative electrode and the soaps migrated towards the But you didn't exactly. do that. It, I don't, well, you can try it, but I didn't. So the, just for anyone who happened to have a neon sign transformer, I've never heard of this, but, uh, <laughs> 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 it, it gives you a good buzz, but that's, you know. <laughs> no, it's dangerous. It's um, dangerous. The current flow is through the oil between those two electrodes. This isn't like a common ground system. Yeah. It's not you're, you're just fine between yeah, these you two don't want to be the common ground. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we did. So it's just the distance between those two electrodes. Exactly. Is and, and, and what the danger is when I thought about scaling this up was the fact is this entire space is yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's, it's electrified. It's yeah. electrified. And, so, you would want and that's how I shot myself. There was a ball that I was getting. And I turned. What's the distance between the electrodes? Uh, it's about L1. 13 or 14 inches. Is that necessary? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I picked that number based on um, doing sort of batches to see the farthest apart that I could get it based on my voltage. If you do a larger voltage, you can get it farther apart. If you do a small, smaller voltage, so you have to keep it closer. Farther apart is better for the process to work. Because you can flow faster. Uh, yep. And it's more dangerous. Uh, yes. <laughs> you, 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 yes. You, 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 would, you would potentially have a greater chance for arcing if you had closer. Right, right. Um, so anyway, there's another whole thing over there. We also do a lot of, I mean, just regular old stuff. So we've got solar panels on the roof. That's what keeps our terminal hot, 12,000 gallon terminal. This is an industrial, by the way, not a copper. Um, here's our newest um, trail location. This is in Burlington at TS Designs. Really neat teaching guys. Um, they've got a tracking solar array and a windmill that uh, will probably never pay itself off. Right. <laughs> um, so, you know, we are constantly trying to implement alternative energy uh, strategies and things like that as well. Hey, Greg. Yeah. Who owns you the uh, trail station? Uh, industrial. Except for the yes. except for the co-op site. The co-op has one site that it owns. It used to be the other way around. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And two term locations. <laughs> we also done that. So one of the other things I wanted to mention, I'm sure for a lot of you probably already up to date on this, but amber light and pure light, here's the big tanks in industrial, the big amber light and pure light tanks. We've messed around on them. Um, but we've had also very good results at the co-op with that. So we have a pure light, actually an amber light tank. An amber light tank that's about yay big. Um, 
it's about this long and about this wide. Um, we initially started with a what eight inch piece of PVC, six four inch, no four inch. <laughs> so a four inch piece of PVC that was really long. Um, now you're at what? Now we're at a tank that's about this tall and about this wide. So the aspect ratio is three or four to one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what it should be. So that's really important, by the way. So if you don't have the proper aspect ratio or you're flowing too fast, you will, um, you'll compact your beads and you'll end up with back pressure. And especially if you use low, low pressurized PVC, it will crack. Crack. That's right. So, so I know we're going to be in your time here, but can you give us a 30 second preview for those of us who may not be up on this? Uh, for pure light? Yeah, sure. So Amulet and Pure Light are two products which are used as a polish for biodiesel. So you pass biodiesel through them and they will take out soap, um, methanol, water, and frequency. Yeah, and, yeah, and they'll exchange essentially. Would you do that home setup post your own drying process or in place oh. of the drying process? After you're done with everything. Okay. So you, you have what you would consider finished fuel. Okay. The, the reason we use this at the co-op is because we've been able to drastically reduce the amount of water washing that we do. So we used to do water washing about 100 gallons of bodies, and we used about 100 gallons of water. And um, when we wanted to move to sell our own biodiesel and hit ASTM spec, we found that we were out of spec for soap, which was actually an internal spec. But anyway, we were out of spec for it. And we need to get our soap numbers down. And this is a great way to do it. And in fact, now that we're using the Android columns, we hit soap spec, and we use 25 gallons of water for every 100 gallons of bodies that goes through. So a drastic drop in the amount of water that we use. Do you rinse the resin yourself to No. Oh, you mean to re recover it? No, we send it back to the manufacturer. But I think it's doable. Um, but no, we don't do it. What was your choice over this versus, say, Magnusol or something? Um, we've had problems with Magnusol in the past. So we did Magnusol, moved on, found Pure Light. What, what it, was it if you were moving the Magnusol? Yeah. How do you know when it's spent? How do you know when it's spent? When you test it and it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. It, but it is. It won't pass. No, it doesn't really, it doesn't really clog. Um, but it, it literally just it will stop working. And in fact, that's what I, that's what I said. Uh, I think here. So the first thing we actually see that tends to stop working is moisture. Okay. Yeah, you'll see your moisture after you, you you get a new column, your moisture starts out at like 200 ppm. And then it's like 300, 400, 500, 600, and then it frosts the levels at about 1,000. Um, but it will continue to take out soap. So I'm not even sure, honestly, now if it's taking soap out or not. I think it may be pretty well close to spent. I think, well, okay. We're different still theories, passing everything. Different theories on that, but um, you, you, you can watch it. The answer is that you watch it slowly become less and less effective, and yeah. at some point you're like, you know what, we've got to swap it out, because yeah. you're testing every single batch. It doesn't sort of go like that, okay. you'll see it. Um, does anyone know what that internal spec is based on? Because a number of producers use the same one, but does any, did anyone actually base that on correlating it to mineral content in uh, ASTM battery tests? I don't think so. Do you want to speak to that for a second? Why we there just isn't a soap spec on the ASTM test. Why, why there is no soap spec, or why we have or a soap spec? Why, well, just that there isn't one. Yes, there spec. isn't a soap spec. All there is is moisture, I'm sorry, water and sediment. Well, In fact, there isn't even a moisture spec. So there, those are two things, moisture and soap are our actual specs. The actual spec mm -hmm. is water and sediment. Water and sediment is just a 100 ml centrifuge tube you spin around, and you see how much crap falls out. Um, and so we like to sort of parse that out and see, well, how much is water and how much is other stuff. Now, you can pass soap and you can pass moisture, and you can still fail water and sediment because you'll get precipitants come out and links in it 100 times and so on. So it is important. All those tests are important. Um, I just hear a lot of people say they go and use this amber light instead of water wash. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you guys use it in addition to water wash. Um, I'm sure you'd probably use it. Instead of water washing, it's good. So why'd you make that choice to put the other people there? The fact is, you have too much soaps coming out of your reactor to put through amber light. You will spend the beads in all of two seconds. So yeah. you, you need to do something. You can do methanol recovery, try to drop the soaps. But you really need to get the soaps down. Like You need to get them pretty low, or you're going to spend your beads really quick. But it's, a, it's also kind of like we're, at the, I'm also being, uh, like we're aiming at um, a really, really, really low number compared to what That's most right. people who produce themselves will do. So it's also putting, creating a situation where you have to spend a lot more time on drying than is common because you're kind of partially washing. You still have extra water because you, have, you still have a fair amount of soap. 
when you're going through a lot of trouble, you kind of get the last little scrap of soap out, and it's not really clear to me that that's necessary from an equi a quality standpoint. So it would be good if somebody correlated that at some point. There is a potassium spec. On and sodium spec. Yeah, exactly, a potassium or, spec. Or sodium. I'm just saying, oh, sorry. There is a there's potassium, a there's a metal spec on in the ASTM, which in theory would correlate somewhere to this, but we haven't done that testing because we don't have that, I, I don't know, we don't have that equipment in-house, so it would be sending it back and forth. To but, be perfectly honest, we have internal specs to try to prove that we're making the best fuel out there. It's true. It, it, it may not honestly matter. At this point, it doesn't. It's not really the point for us. For you guys, you can decide whatever you want to do, whatever you feel comfortable with. And, and also, I'd like to add one more thing. That at, because we're small scale but still trying to be on road spec, it's, it's an added level of robustness in our wash process. So we feel like we're doing the water wash and drying and then finishing off this polish with Pure Light. And we probably are at spec before we go through Pure Light, but that gives us that added um, redundancy to make sure that we do because it's very difficult. We don't have enough space to then send it. It's a big pain in the neck if we miss to send it back through the process because right. we usually already have another batch right behind it. So we're trying to give ourselves more redundancy in the wash process. Yeah, you don't want to miss. Can you decrease the water usage? We did. Okay. Further than yeah. we ever did, you mean? Yeah. Um, you could, but like I said, you're going to spend your beads a little faster. Yeah, so if you're doing like a quarter of water, like a little wash and then putting your feet dry, well, that's like a, some type of lifetime, basically. You know, I know it depends on your capacity, but... Well, and it also depends on how much, uh, like I said, what is the quality of the stuff coming into the pure light. Yeah, um, yeah. In our case, I think this is our first, this is our first column that we went through. It was seven cents a gallon of finished wagon. So that was a cost to us. I think they say about one pound of pure light does about 100 gallons of bodies. We have an 80 pound, um, is that right? No. A thousand. Yes. Wait. We have 80 pounds in our pure light comp. We've done, we're expected to do 8,000 pounds. So I guess that's one to a thousand. An 80 pound comp, we expect to do about 8,000 gallons. We're, we're right about there, actually. Pretty close to that. And so a good thing to say is, had you not washed that fuel before running it through, that 8,000 gallons dropped to like hardly nothing. You can spend the column. Yeah, you can spend the column. You can spend it fast. Yeah. And then it's expensive, like there's no sense doing that. Uh, the STM, though, the chicken fat in that, which are animal fat, you can't meat the STM with uh, using animal fat. So yeah, you can. You can? We do. Well, it, Lard, I, I guess the spoiling part of it is what's most Oxidation stability, what you're talking about? It's actually better. Oxidation stability? Yeah, yeah. It's better. My, okay, my next question is, and you're probably going to read system, uh, the, the treatment of the water before you, you spill it out and send it on the way, is there anything there that centrifuge that will take the, <coughs> the crud out of the water before we actually put it into the, uh, the send it on it for the garden, or the, the, the sewer? I mean, the one thing you can do is, you know, add acid to it, see if you can get the bites out, Mark. Um, I would be speaking to that as a little more way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's, right. keep, let's keep running along. Um, uh, one quick thing, when you make your column, make sure you get the aspect ratio right, that's one thing I really want to make sure, and make sure you get good dispersion incoming and outgoing. So if you build a column like this, you know, and you just have a little point where it's coming in, a little point where it's going out, well guess what, the water, just, the liquid is just going to go like that. If you miss the sides, and it's going to tend to clog right in front of that hole. So make sure you have some sort of dispersion um, on the input and outputs you're using the whole column. It's kind of an important thing. So we go Plinko chips. Yeah, yeah, no, that's all right. So I guess that's about it. Um, so if anybody has any other questions about anything I talked about.